Welcome to Masada. Today's review will be broken down into two parts. First, I will be covering the sights around this amazing place. Then, at the end of the video, I'll go into the dramatic and tragic historical event that happened here around 73 AD. Now, the Bible doesn't mention Masada, but was it referenced in 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel chapter 24, we see David having an encounter with King Saul at En Gedi, which is 12 miles north of Masada. In verse 22, it says, So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Could this stronghold be Masada? It's really unknown, and there haven't been any record of anything existing at this site until a thousand years after David's lifetime. According to Jewish historian Josephus, there was a fort built on Masada sometime between the 2nd century and early 1st century BC during the Hasmonean period, but there haven't been any findings to confirm this as of yet. So who built up Masada? Well, most of what you see here was built by King Herod the Great. As I covered in previous videos, he was a master builder who built up the port city of Caesarea along the Mediterranean Sea and built the Temple of Augustus in the north at Caesarea Philippi. His most known building accomplishment is his expansion of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. Herod was a brutal tyrant, a monster, and a self-centered king, but he was a genius when it came to his building projects. Now, there are three ways to get to the top of Masada. The Roman siege ramp on the west side, the snake path, or the cable car ride, which are both on the east side. We chose the cable car on this day. As you enter Masada from the east side, you first notice a quarry. A good portion of the rocks used in what was built here came from the surrounding landscape, which makes sense with this mesa being over 1,400 feet high. Once you enter, you come into the Commandant's residence on one side and the Commandant's headquarters on the other side with an open square in the middle. The Commandant was responsible for controlling the traffic of visitors to the palace and to oversee the unloading and inspection of goods for all the large storerooms. Speaking of which, the large storerooms. According to Josephus, these storerooms contain massive amounts of corn, wine, oil, dates, and pulses, which are edible seeds from a legume plant. Herod was very paranoid, so he set this up if he had to retreat and stay here for a long period of time. Next to the storerooms is the guard room. Here, the palace guards would protect the entrance to some of the storerooms, and it's believed, besides food, some of the rooms were exclusively for storing weapons. As we move along towards the northern palace, we come across some of the actual steps from the late 1st century BC. Here you can see the modern steps made for us tourists to use now. Then we come to the large bathhouse. The courtyard here was used to exercise prior to getting in the water. But the bathhouse wasn't just a place to get clean. It was a critical part of Roman social and cultural life, which King Herod was obsessed with. The focus of luxury is indicated with the vivid frescoes and the colorful stone floors. In the period during the revolt, the Jewish rebels converted parts of the bathhouse into mikvahs, or ritual baths, which was very important when following Jewish law. Now, on to the northern palace and what is truly a remarkable feat of engineering. Built along the cliff in three sections, the upper terrace was Herod's private quarters. This here is believed to be Herod's bedroom where you can still see the original mosaics on the floor. Here is the balcony where Herod would likely sit, relaxing with the cool evening breeze coming off the Dead Sea. The middle terrace, circular in shape, is thought to be either a place of religious or cultic worship or perhaps a meeting place for Herod's visitors, kind of like a first century conference room. The lower terrace was possibly used for more private relaxation for Herod or could have been where his guests would have stayed. During the excavations, three skeletons from a man, a woman, and a child were found in the lower terrace, with the woman still having her braided hair preserved. As you leave the northern side and begin to head to the west side, you come upon the rebel synagogue. This building was most likely a stable when Herod built it, but it became a synagogue during the Jewish revolt. Under the floor in one of the small rooms, they found fragments of biblical scrolls, including the vision of dry bones from the book of Ezekiel. Next, we come to the Western Palace. The Western Palace was the first thing built at Masada by Herod the Great, 
We didn't get to spend a lot of time here due to time restraints because the park was closing soon. Here is the Columbrium Tower. They had three of these in total and were used for raising doves. The doves supplied meat for Masada's inhabitants and guests and probably also fertilizer for the agricultural crops. So what actually happened here? Sometime after Herod the Great died, the Romans put a garrison at Masada. At the outbreak of the Jewish revolt against the Romans in 66 AD, some rebels or zealots came and overtook Masada. Then, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed along with the second temple, which Jesus foretold happening in Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Many of the Jews who were able to flee Jerusalem joined the rebels at Masada, totaling 960 people, including women and children. They were all led by Eliezer ben Yair. This became the last Jewish holdout versus Rome. The Romans set up eight camps around Masada, which you can still see the ruins of their camps today. Then they built a siege ramp on the west side of the plateau and eventually breached the wall, which you can see here. The night before the Romans entered Masada and seeing their defeat at hand, Eliezer ben Yair convinced the other rebels to commit suicide instead of being slaves to Rome. It ended up being 953 men, women, and children that died that night. Two women and five children were the only survivors of this tragedy, as they were found hidden in one of the massive cisterns Herod created to collect water for the fortress. Today, soldiers who complete basic training for the IDF will climb up the snake path at night to the top of Masada, and when they are done being sworn in, will shout, Masada shall not fall again. This concludes my review of Masada. I hope you really enjoyed it. In my next review, I will take you to the Dead Sea, but I'll leave you with this question. Is there anything significant found in the Bible concerning the Dead Sea? Tune in next time to find out. Thank you for watching, and God bless.